shoulder. Typically, the lower lip has two, only two forms with a division between them. So now we're drawing live, and I shall go down and start, try to establish immediately something of the, of the perspective of it. Now, this form here has become very thin, and this form here is obviously because of the perspective is, is shorter, but it's also quite thin. And this one here is almost not there at all. So the, the components are still there, but they're different proportions. The lower lip is much more pronounced. Certain dip in the middle and a pronounced cut back underneath. And so, now the lips are only part of it. The whole mouth, the old outer mouth area, as I said, is overlaying the teeth. So, you just get a feeling of what's happening on the upper lip, at the side of the mouth. It's hard to know where to stop. Inevitably, you, 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 you're coming up the nose there, but, and the feeling of what's happening underneath the mouth, too. It's quite, you can see it clearly on this side. This side's not quite so clear, but here we can see how the corner of the mouth cuts back in and has a very pronounced form running into the cheek form. And that area there, this is the underneath of the, of the lip. has a certain sort of, 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 uh, of tissue covering the lip, which is somewhat ridged. Very often catches light in little dozen shapes. Right, so there you see you have the same, same basic forms, but their proportions are different. And finally to the ear. Now a lot of people are very frightened or too casual about the ear. They tend to treat it as a sort of amorphous cabbage-like shape. In fact, it has a very precise anatomy. Uh, and I'll show you. Can you turn so that I can see your ear? Right. Now I'm going to use some names. You don't have to learn, but it's easy for me to explain what's there. The actual consistent parts of the anatomy of the ear that are always there, although their shapes may vary. Now here's the tragus. This is the, this little springy piece in front of the ear. And from that, you always get typically a fold running around, which is called the antihelix surrounding a depression, which is where the, the sound waves go in, and it's called the concha, and diving underneath another fold, an outer fold, which is called the, the helix. Now that helix slides in an interesting way into the concha. It's, it's, a, it's a nice design, it's a very good design, which channels air and the sound waves into the inner ear. So that happens. Now if you take this helix around, that follows more or less closely the inner fold, which is the anti-helix, and peters out somewhere other down here so that the lowest form here, which can be very pendulous, very many shapes, the lobe, everybody knows what the lobe is, is at the bottom of the ear. Now if we follow that back again, the helix, the antihelix, the concha, the tragus. Now they are consistent. Every ear has those shapes. 
there are one or two little extra things. You sometimes have a little cleft in here. It's, they refer to these as fossa, but it only means ditches. And there's this little cleft here that very often happens. It isn't always there. You'll see variations, but basically those will always be the shapes. I'm going to add a few individual variations here to this here. There's a little cleft and a slight protuberance in the antihelix here and a, 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 a more extreme turn. That's, a, that's an individual variation. It's not always there, but here it is. And we can, I think we can, the actual tragus is not as dominant. That's a typical shape of ear. You'll maybe see a tiny crease here where it, just before it changes into the form of the cheek. Now to bring it all together, everything we've been looking at, the spaces between the features, the features themselves, now we want to try and bring it in all together in one head and shoulders, one face, and here we have the live model from which to draw. Now, Bally, would you like to, yes, just turn slightly to your, to your right, okay, and now I'm going to ask the model to look directly at me with her eyes. This will produce a very close contact looking drawing. When I'm drawing the eyes, I'll say, look at me. In the meantime, look wherever you like, but don't move your head so your eyes don't get too tired. Right, now the first thing I like to establish is a little triangle which links the centres of the eyes. It could be the pupils or sort of somewhere around the centre with the mouth. Now that triangle does several things. It relates the, the features together, and it also tells me something about whether the, the, feet, the whole head is tilted. Because the, the top of this inverted triangle is, is sloping down to the left somewhat, I know that the centre line of the head is tipped. She's slightly tipped. You can mark those quite strongly. It, it, they'll, they'll, they'll be diminished later. Now can you, for the moment, Look at me, Bally, and I'm just going to suggest the position of, of the left eye. Moving across. I'm using quite a light colour here because I'm not sure this is where they're going to end up. And the positions, as we've said, are very important. But this is, this is my first approximation. And it can be overpowered by stronger shapes later on. OK, you don't have to look at me, look at me now for a few minutes. Rest your eyes. Notice I haven't got to the outline of the head yet, drawing from the inside out. I'm coming down to where I expected the mouth, the centre of the mouth to be. But don't be totally committed by it. I know it's going to be somewhere there. Looks as though it's not going to be far out actually. But looking at the Upper lip. Perhaps it's down just a mite too much.